Thank you. Um, how's everybody doing? Um, so I wrote this book, We Are the Weather, and it's largely about it's sort of a personal investigation into why I found myself saying so often over the course of the last few years, somebody has to do something. Somebody has to do something. If I would see images of the Amazon burning or a superstorm approaching the coast or the wildfires in California or any of the couple dozen other things that we now see, pieces of evidence of the present impact of climate change, I would say we have to do something. And I would have really strong emotions when I would look at those images like anger or despair or sometimes I would feel motivated. Um, but then the second I wasn't looking at them, you know, if I would turn away or the news would turn away, I would just kind of go back to life as it was and not really think about it that much. If somebody asked me, do you care? I would say, yes, of course I care. But if someone were observing my life, it would probably seem like I didn't care very much. Um, how many people in this room um, believe in the science of climate change, which maybe is described, the world is warming because of human activities? Okay, so every single person in this room. As it turns out, almost every single person now acknowledges the science of climate change. In America, 91% um, of those asked say they acknowledge the science of climate change. Twice as many Americans believe in the existence of Bigfoot as deny the existence of climate change. 70% of Americans have said they wished America would have stayed in the Paris Climate Accords, and that includes the majority of Republicans. I think there's a sort of misunderstanding about the balance of people who are acceptors of the science and deniers of the science. And a lot of us have the impression that about half of the country doesn't believe that it's happening, um, when in fact there's a very small slice of the country that doesn't believe that it's happening, including the president, unfortunately, but um, only about 9% of Americans. But it sort of begs another question, which is what do you mean when you say believes that it's happening? Like, what is, is saying that you acknowledge the science, science of climate change to believe that it's happening? Um, and I want to read just like a page or two from the book. I'm not going to do much reading. This is the only reading, in fact, that I'm going to do at all while I'm here, because I think it's a subject that's best served with conversation. But this will give you a sense of sort of where the book is coming from and where I'm coming from and what I mean when I say, what does it mean actually to believe that climate change is happening? In 1942, a 28-year-old Catholic in the Polish underground, Jan Karski, embarked on a mission to travel from Nazi-occupied Poland to London and ultimately America to inform world leaders of what the Germans were perpetrating. In anticipation of his journey, he met with several resistance groups, accumulating information and testimonies to bring to the West. After surviving as perilous a journey as could be imagined, Karski arrived in Washington, D.C. in June 1943. There, he met with Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, one of the great legal minds in American history, and himself a Jew. After hearing Karski's account of the clearing of the Warsaw Ghetto and of exterminations in the concentration camps, after asking him a series of increasingly specific questions like, what's the height of the wall that separates the ghetto from the rest of the city? Frankfurter paced the room in silence, then took his seat and said, Mr. Karski, a man like me talking to a man like you must be totally frank. So I must say that I'm unable to believe what you told me. When Karski's colleague pleaded with Frankfurter to accept Karski's account, Frankfurter responded, I didn't say that this young man is lying. I said that I am unable to believe him. My mind and my heart, they're made in such a way that I cannot accept it. Frankfurter didn't question the truthfulness of Karski's story. He didn't dispute that the Germans were systematically murdering the Jews of Europe, his own relatives. And he didn't respond that while he was persuaded and horrified, there was nothing he could do. Rather, he admitted not only his inability to believe the truth, but his awareness of that inability. Our minds and hearts are well-built to perform certain tasks and poorly designed for others. 
We're good at things like calculating the path of a hurricane and bad at things like deciding to get out of its way. Because we evolved over hundreds of millions of years in settings that bear little resemblance to the modern world, we're often led to desires, fears, and indifferences that neither correspond nor respond to modern realities. We're disproportionately drawn to immediate and local needs. We crave fats and sugars, which are bad for people, which are, excuse me, are bad for people who live in a world of their ready availability. We hypervigilantly watch our children on jungle gyms, despite the many greater risks to their health that we ignore, while remaining indifferent to what is lethal but feels like it's over there. Although many of climate changes accompanying calamities, extreme weather events, floods, and wildfires, displacement and resource scarcity chief among them, are vivid, personal, and suggestive of a worsening situation. They just don't feel that way in aggregate. They feel abstract and distant and isolated rather than like beams of an ever-strengthening narrative. So-called climate change deniers reject the conclusion that 97% of climate scientists have reached. The planet is warming because of human activity. But what about those of us who say we accept the reality of human-caused climate change? We may not think that the scientists are lying, but are we able to believe what they tell us? Such a belief would surely awaken us to the urgent ethical imperative attached to it, shake our collective conscience, and render us willing to make small sacrifices in the present to avoid cataclysmic ones in the future. Intellectually accepting the truth isn't virtuous in and of itself, and it won't save us. As a child, I was often told, you know better when I did something that I shouldn't have done. Knowing was the difference between a mistake and an offense. If we accept a factual reality that we're destroying the planet, but are unable to believe it, we are no better than those who deny the existence of human-caused climate change, just as Felix Frankfurter was no better than those who denied the existence of the Holocaust. And when the future distinguishes between these two kinds of denial, which will appear to be a grave error and which an unforgivable crime. So the book is, is largely about this challenge to somehow summon the right feelings or somehow summon belief about climate change, which we know about, and what to do with the problem of maybe being unable to summon the right feelings or being unable to believe, and how can we change our habits and just change our norms of living so that we're doing the right thing, even if we're not inspired to do the right thing. And it's uncontroversial that four individual activities matter more than any others. Um, they are flying less, living car free, as opposed to having a hybrid or even an electric car, having fewer kids, somehow controlling overpopulation, and eating a plant-based diet. So 85% of Americans drive to work, and most of the cities that we live in, not all, but most, were designed to require cars. More than half of the flights that are taken in America are either for work or for um, non-leisure personal purposes, like visiting a sick relative. And most people aren't in the process of deciding whether or not to have a kid in any given moment. So those three things we absolutely need to work on, but it's not as easy as just saying like, hey, stop flying, hey, stop driving, no more kids. But food is a little bit different because for most of us, for I, everybody in this room for sure, it's an unconstrained, unrestrained choice. Um, we eat what we wanna eat and we make that choice three times a day. And it's the only one of those four actions that immediately addresses the methane and nitrous oxide, which are two of the most powerful greenhouse gases. Methane is 86 times as powerful as carbon and nitrous oxide is 310 times as powerful, which is to say, like, if you imagine the greenhouse gas effect, like a blanket around the earth that's holding heat against the earth, um, methane is a blanket that's 86 times as thick as carbon and nitrous oxide is 310 times as thick, which matters because we're facing a ticking clock where if we don't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and reduce the warming, we're going to enter 
into runaway climate change where we can't undo certain processes that have been started. So what I've been thinking about a lot and what I wrote about is how to make this connection between what we know and what we care about. I didn't ask any of you if you cared about the fate of the planet because I just took for granted that you all do. Um, I've never met a person who doesn't. This is not something that is dependent on your background, political or geographic or socioeconomic. Um, how do we take the knowledge that we have and the care that we have and do something with it? I had a really unusual experience and a moving experience the other day. It was about two weeks ago now at a reading where after the reading there was a signing and a young couple came up to me in the signing line and they you know, put the book in front of me as people do and they opened it to the title page as people do. But instead of it being empty, it was filled with their handwriting. And I said, what's this? And they said, well, we're getting married in a couple of months and we decided tonight that we really need to have a plan because if we don't have a plan, we're just going to probably keep doing what we've always done regardless of what we know and regardless of our best intentions. And their plan read, um, eat vegetarian unless served meat at a friend's house, um, eat vegan two days a week, have no more than two kids, and drive no more than 1,000 miles in the next year. And instead of just having me sign it, they had a little line that said witness under it, and they wanted me to sign that. And I thought that was really great. I thought the particularness of their plan was really great. You know, I felt like I got to know them and their priorities a little bit and their own their limitations a little bit by their plan. Um, and then it hit me that um, I had written this book. They were there for ha to have me sign the book. I've been thinking about climate change for the last two years very actively and professionally, and I didn't have a plan. You know, probably like a lot of you, I thought, I'm going to try to fly less. That's a good thing to try to do. Um, but what does that mean? And does anybody ever act on a statement as vague as that? Um, does anybody in this room have a plan for how they, as, as an individual, are going to work against climate change? I don't mean go to a march when there's a march. But does anybody have a plan? So there's one person in this entire room I mean, it's kind of startling, isn't it? Like if, if the kinds of people who are in this room with access to the information that people in this room have and with the values that I'm sure the people in this room have don't have plans, it's um, how do we think we're going to solve this thing? So the problem of climate change isn't going to be solved by individual action alone. But individual action is not actually just individual action. You know, when we decide to eat less meat, for example, it has a real world effect, you know, without a doubt. But it has more than just the effect of reducing, you know, emissions by that extraordinarily minuscule amount, because we don't really eat alone. We eat in communities and we eat as families. And if one of you decided tomorrow, hey, because of, you know, I've been thinking about this climate change stuff, and I'm not going to become a vegetarian, but I could definitely reduce the amount of meat that I eat. If one of you said that aloud, if you had witnesses, then I guarantee other people start to think about it and there's a kind of social contagion that happens. Um, I've never heard like a leader who talks about climate change share a plan. I don't hear environmentalists talk about their plans. I've never heard Al Gore talk about what is his plan? What is he doing? I happen to know he's a vegan. It's a shame that he doesn't talk about that more. There may be very good reasons why, or he thinks there may be good reasons why not to talk about it yet. But um, so the person who raised his hand, it was just you in the back, right? Yeah. Can I ask what your plan is? It's not like an actual plan, but I, I, I sold my car. And then you like figure out the plan from that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, like, it's like being a vegan. Like that's not, a, it's not like a plan. You just like put re restrictions on yourself and then you figure it out. Yeah, so that's really great. Um, you know, our, our choices for transportation are one part of how we participate in either the like repairing of the world or the destruction of the world, but they're just one part. You know, it's good. I think that if those if those four activities, which I said are the the most high impact activities, it feels like a plan should address 
all four of those. Again, the baby one maybe doesn't doesn't need to have a place um, unless you're in the process of thinking about that or imagine that you will be sometime soon. Um, and I and also I think some sort of like participation in the systemic, not just the individual action, but you know, here's an organization that I'm going to give this amount of money to this year, or I'm going to donate this number of hours a week to, and being as specific as possible. You know, like when I first started to write my plan, um, I said, I'm going to, you know, advocate for da la 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 la. And I was like, what? Okay, so I'll be a little more specific. I'll just like write, I'll write letters to my congressman. And I thought, oh, that really sounds like bullshit because. That's not a lot for me to do, and it's not going to do a lot. I just know it's not. It's narcissistic. Like, it feels good to say that. Then I will have relieved a kind of anxiety that I've been feeling. And I think a lot of us have been feeling a, a very low level, almost entirely ignorable anxiety or alienation from ourselves when it comes to climate change because we know we're not doing the thing that needs to be done. We just know it. We know we're not doing it on the individual level, and we know we're not doing it collectively. And one good way to have that anxiety revealed is to do something. And then you feel the kind of resolution of that anxiety or some bit of it, a relief. Like when you close the distance between the person that you believe you are and describe yourself as being, and then the person that you actually are as determined by your actions, it can feel really quite good. Um, and it can feel like a pro a, a problem that you had been living with can suddenly become visible. So my plan for right now, and I'm working on it, and I'm also very, very open to anybody's suggestions, is um, I, I don't eat any animal products for breakfast and lunch, and I eat vegetarian for dinner. That's based in just the science, the most comprehensive analysis of the relationship between animal agriculture and climate change, which was published last year. Um, said that while people who live in undernourished parts of the world could afford to eat a little bit more meat and a little bit more dairy, citizens of America, the UK, and Europe need to reduce their meat consumption by 90% and their dairy consumption by 60% in order to prevent what they called catastrophic, irreversible um, climate catastrophe. The IPCC, in their most recent report, said even if we were to do everything that we're talking about with fossil fuels, we have zero hope, zero chance, zero probability of meeting the goals of the Paris Climate Accords unless we dramatically change how we farm animals and dramatically reduce the amount of animal products that we eat. Um, so that's, that's sort of my step in that direction. And I should say it's not like effortless or easy for me. I've been an on and off vegetarian for a long time. But weirdly enough, the longer that I have been a vegetarian, the more I have craved meat. Um, I'm not the kind of vegetarian who finds it disgusting or repulsive or um, just the opposite. Like when I see the person across from me eating it, I often think, I wish I could eat that. That looks really good. Um, and, you know, if I were like a lion, my obligations would end there. I'd say, I wish I could eat that. I'm now going to eat that. But I'm a human being and not a lion. And so I'm capable of like balancing different impulses, even finding a way to give weight to ones that are less immediate and less primitive, um, but ultimately stronger. In terms of flying, I've said that I won't fly for vacations in 2020. In terms of driving, I've said that I will um, only take three cab rides a week. Maybe that sounds stupid. Maybe that sounds unambitious. Like one of the reasons it's very hard to make a plan is because you have to confront your own limitations and the unambitiousness of your own limits. You know, if you say like, I'm going to fly a lot less, nobody knows what that means and it can just feel good. If you have to actually put numbers on it, it, it sounds like le it sounds like you're capable of doing less than you would have imagined and less than feels like enough. So it's easier just not to say it at all and just to say, I'm going to try to fly less next year, even though it won't affect your behavior at all or very, very little. And I also decided that I'm going to um, devote a day a week to working with um, 350.org, which is the organization Bill McKibben started, and also with the New York City Public Schools to work 
on just bringing awareness in terms of the science, but also in terms of habits to students. Because I like the idea of working very locally and you know interacting with people face to face. So, you know, that plan of mine actually isn't enough, and um, it's also a plan that I know I am unlikely to be consistent with. But it's a world of difference than what I was doing before I had that plan. And it organizes my life in a way that, in a way, is a kind of relieves the pressure of having to have feelings all the time and having to be moved and having to remember my values. I just am now somebody who doesn't do that and who doesn't do that. And I think that that's a kind of reorientation that will make saving the planet much, much easier if we take the emphasis off of our feelings and turn ourselves into people who just by habit do certain things. Like when I'm in a store, if there's something I want to buy, excuse me, something I want to have, I don't even contemplate shoplifting. You know, I don't have to wait for that well of emotions that says like, oh, but you're part of this social contract and you're a citizen and think about the poor shopkeeper if you were to take this without paying. I'm just, people don't do that. I'm not a person who does that. And it's that simple. So making these things habitual and starting to, I think, shift the norms and the defaults. You know, with, in the case of food, until very recently, we've thought about it like there's only two options. You're a vegetarian or you're not. Like if you're concerned about animal welfare, if you're concerned about um, far, the treatment of farmers, if you're concerned about human health, if you're concerned about climate change, not to mention water pollution and air pollution and the erosion of topsoil, loss of biodiversity. You're either vegetarian or you're not, because to inhabit that middle space leaves you open to accusations or feelings of hypocrisy. Like it's hard to admit that these things are bad and not to stop doing them completely. And we've been measuring our distances from this kind of perfection that nobody's gonna attain anyway, instead of measuring our distance from just doing absolutely nothing. Um, and I think that if we could flip that around, a lot of people would be not only willing, but eager to enter that really big space. Um, so I've said a bit. Uh, as I said, I find that this works better in conversation. I always love just hearing about other people's processes. You know. Climate change itself is not an event, it's a process. Um, it's not like we're gonna, even though I've used the expression today already, but it's not like we're gonna save the planet or not save the planet. It's not as if we're doomed or everything is gonna be fine. Um, we're not doomed and not everything is gonna be fine. Like we're at the beginning of a process of really profound loss, loss of the Amazon, loss of species, loss of coastal cities, um, loss of a lot of lives. And some of that loss has been determined, but the, virtually all of it has not been determined and will be determined by what we do, what we do as individuals, what we do as corporations, what we do as nations. It's that talking about this as a process and not as an event and hearing, when I hear somebody say like, uh, you know, here's my ethical accomplishment. I've decided that in 2000, you know, I, I don't, I gave up my car, I gave up my plane, I gave up my meat never going to have kids. I just think like, okay, well, that's good. That sounds great. I'm glad that you exist, but there's not a lot of room for me in that conversation. When somebody shares with me their process and their struggles and says, like I, I was in San Francisco last night and I did an event with Samin Nostrat, the, the cook who does salt, fat, acid, heat, that show on Netflix. And really remarkably, she's now deciding, trying to not um, eat animal products for breakfast and lunch. And then at dinner, she'll do what she does for dinner. Um, and the way she talks about it is like, oh, I don't want to do this. Like, ooh, this is going to be hard. I'm probably going to be inconsistent about it. And when she talks like that, I, I don't know, I felt really inspired. I thought, yeah, it's going to be hard for me too. Like flying, that's going to be really hard for me. I happen to find making dietary changes easier than she does because I'm not as invested in food as she is. Like if someone said to me, you can't use adjectives and verbs, like before dinner, I would say, oh, that's gonna be especially hard for me. Um, different things are hard for different people. 
we don't all have to have the same plan, but we do all need to have plans and to codify them and to share them and to have witnesses. So um, I would, I'd be really happy to try to answer any questions you have or hear other ways of thinking about these things. I definitely have not resolved my own ways of thinking, not even close. So I'm always eager to be nudged in different directions. So, so with respect to these plans, um, how have you thought about balancing it? Like, have you thought like, it's more important that I don't take flights or more important that I, you know, be more plant-based or like, how have you weighed the different things or have you done that or something? So the basic weighing is just that, um, an awareness of there's a kind of hierarchy of how impactful different decisions are. And um, the four most impactful are the ones that I shared. The things, by the way, beneath them, things like recycling, like getting a hybrid, like planting trees, if anybody ever does that, um, those are also things we should do. Getting solar panels is something we should do. Not using plastic straws is something we should do. Um, but as humans have like, or most humans have a limited amount of energy both like logistical and emotional, it just make, makes sense to devote yourself to the things that matter most. So um, I think of those, those four activities as like the ones that I put above the others. Within them, I don't know that I, within them, I would only say I do as much as I can. I feel like I'm being fairly honest about what my own limitations are. Like I didn't say that I was gonna be vegan, you know, for three days, three meals a day. Um, I wish I were. I think it's better than what I'm doing, but I find what I'm doing to be actually a stretch and to be challenging. So I would rather, um, you know, accomplish this with the hope of expanding than set myself a goal that I really do know is unrealistic, which will end up with me doing far less than by this path hear your thoughts on how to induce uh, collective action. Um, the analogy being like, if I was like, I'm going to make the parks better, like everyone, if you like, you know, donate a hundred bucks, you know, maybe some people would do it. But if I say, hey, uh, you know, um, here's a, a property tax levy, you know, it's, it's Seattle, like 80% of people are going to vote to raise the taxes, but just because they know everyone else is going to do it. So how do we, how do we have like a, a similar process for um, transportation or I, I think I actually I, I think I think like food is like the hardest one you know like you going it's like inspiring but how, how do you like an induce collective action well so you know we there's a kind of debate now about whether individual choice is more important or systemic change is more important and as if they were different things they're not different like individual choices when done, when they, as they accumulate and become collective, influence or compel systemic change. Um, you know, the fastest growing sector in the food industry in America is cage-free and free-range eggs. Not because like the industry woke up and decided, hey, this is it's clearly more ethical to give a hen. You know, uh, caged hens have about the amount of square footage on in their cages as there is on the cover of this paperback, a little less even. Um, they didn't wake up and realize that that was wrong. It's people decided one at a time that they wanted something different and a food that you couldn't find anywhere 10 years ago, you can now get at a gas station, cage for your free range egg. So, you know, as we have asked for different things, different things are given to us. Um, you know, look at like the Beyond Burger or the Impossible Burger. Um, there was nowhere where you could find a veggie burger, no like main national chain um, a year ago, to my knowledge. Maybe like some places experimented with it briefly. Now they're just everywhere. And what I find really exciting about that is um, it's not really food for vegetarians or it's not exclusively food for vegetarians. It's food for meat eaters who want to eat less meat. 90% of people who bought Beyond Burgers in supermarkets also bought meat in the period that they were examining the buying habits. Um, when KFC released this um, vegetarian fried chicken in Atlanta, they're going to go national with it now. 
they had photographs. It was on, in the New York Times of like people around the street to eat it. And I saw that and I didn't think like, oh, the future's now. That's amazing. I just thought that's a bunch of vegetarians who are going to buy vegetarian food. But what was really cool was, well, two things. One, KFC painted the restaurant green that day. And which is to say it wasn't like they were trying to quietly offer something to a very small um, portion of their or expand their audience, maybe a tiny bit. They were making an announcement that like, this is something we are doing. We want everyone to know we're doing it. And we're making the connection to the environment. And in their statement, they said, we don't think of this as a, as a food for vegetarians. We think of it as a food for meat eaters who want to eat less meat. So, you know, the, Am the burning of the Amazon, when people see those images, they get really upset. You know, everybody in here gets upset when they see them. And that emotion most often takes the form of anger, I think, um, directed at Bolsonaro and maybe at Trump to some extent. 91% of Amazonian deforestation is for animal agriculture, um, either to create land for livestock to graze or to create land to grow crops for the livestock. If Greta Thunberg said, hey, students of the world, let's boycott beef. Like, we don't need it. It's bad for us anyway in the quantities that we're eating it. And they, this burning is being done for that habit. Like We are writing the checks that make that burning happen. I guarantee, I guarantee regulation would follow from that and legislation would follow. I'm not saying that meat would be illegal. That's crazy. It's not going to happen. Um, and it doesn't need to happen. You know, we don't need to stop eating these things. We just need to eat a lot less. It would be helpful to eat a lot less if it cost what it actually cost. You know, when we go to the, like, if you go to a fast food place or if you buy anywhere you buy meat, it's an artificially deflated cost because there's enormous subsidies to the factory farm industry and because nobody holds them accountable for the environmental destruction that they're creating. If all we did was enforce the laws that are on the books and subsidize it less, Hamburgers would become more expensive than the other things that we would eat, and we would eat less of them. I think that there can be this virtuous cycle of people saying, not only with their words and posters, but with their dollars, like, we don't want to support this thing anymore unless it changes. And then corporations and governments will change in response to that, which will make it much easier for us to make the kinds of decisions that are good, which will make it easier for the system to change. So I think it will happen in a, in a cycle but we need to make, I mean, it, you could overstate how much change we need to make in our lives, but you could understate it as well. Like the science that I shared was not my opinion. I wasn't saying what would be amazing is if we could reduce our meat consumption by 90%. I'm saying the science tells us that if we don't, we're going to have irreversible, catastrophic environmental damage. So we can know that science and ignore it. We can know that science and reduce our consumption of those products by that amount. We can do our best. Those are things that each of us has to wrestle with. Good, thank you. Uh, so I don't want this to be like a gotcha type thing, but I'm curious because I was just reading today about a bunch of forest fires in the Indonesian uh, uh, rainforest. And a lot of that was clearing land also, but for like palm oil agriculture, which is like obviously not a meat based thing. And I'm just curious, um, I think that that's an excellent point about like the uh, sort of systemic like connected nature of like our meat consumption is leading to this type of deforestation. But when there isn't necessarily that same connection, is there any action that you could see that we could take as individuals that would um, help to like force change in these other ways? So it's not as if meat is bad and other foods are good. I would never say that. Um, industrialized food production is often bad and like more traditional food production is much better. And that's true for meat or anything else. And there are definitely other kinds of non-meat foods that are hugely destructive. Um, it just turns out meat is much more destructive. And I don't doubt that, you know, the palm oil industry is creating quite a bit of deforestation, but 80% of deforestation globally is just for meat. And as I said, 91% of Amazonian deforestation is just for meat. But um, we should be a, a, as sensitive as we can be about what we eat. And that does not exclusive to meat at all. Um, and it's not exclusive to food at all. And I, you know, it's funny. It's, it's just so interesting that you said it's not a gotcha moment because I appreciate that you said that because there's a way that, and it's so unfortunate that these conversations 
can have a kind of gotcha quality, even though we don't want them to at all. Like I did a reading the other day and a woman stood up in this kind of question and answer session and was like, well, you know, you haven't mentioned fashion. And did you know that the carbon footprint of a t-shirt is, and then she started throwing some statistics at me. And my first instinct was to say, well, come on, that you may be saying that, but what you're not remembering is that the carbon footprint, and I was like, why would we do that? Why would we get into that? Why would we make our small disagreements, which honestly aren't even disagreements, they're more like areas of particular interest, or, you know, specialties. Why would we make that the point when our agreement is so broad? You know, our agreement is 99.9%. .9 we agree that, you know, we need to do these things to um, act on the values that we share um, in the interest of our shared concerns. And what I said to her was what I meant, which is like, I should learn more about that. That is something I need to know about, you know? And maybe I'll find out she was exactly right. Maybe I'll find out she wasn't quite right. Um, but, you know, we often, I think now there's a temptation to slip into, oh my God, now I have to care about that mode. I don't know if you ever feel that. I just felt a little bit of it when you said that. Like, not that I consume so much palm oil, but, you know, oh my God, now I have to, Go look at that. And I have to think about that. I was thinking about a story that a, a friend of mine experienced not that long ago when he um, went with his mother um, to, the, to the doctor to get some scan results. And they weren't expecting anything particularly bad. And the doctor, it was one of these like, you have two months to live moments. And my friend was in the room with her. And she said, why me? Why me? And then she said, why have I been so lucky? Like why have I had such a great life and all of these blessings? And I think it's useful to try to orient ourselves toward an appreciation of all that we have. You know, we have to eat a little less of a few foods when we can eat hundreds and thousands of different kinds of foods. Um, we have to fly a little bit less when we've had these lives where we can, you know, have the ability that nope, our parents and grandparents never could have, my parents and grandparents really couldn't have dreamed of having. Um, what's being asked of us is so small compared to what's been given to us and what we have and what we want others to have, what we want our kids and our grandkids to have and what we want strangers halfway around the world to have, that if we have to think about a few more things, well, then that's just the price we have to pay for having all that we have. And it's a great deal. You know, it's a great deal. It's not a burden. Um, so one of the interesting things that um, the, I think we have to think when making these trade-offs about our decisions, and I find difficult, is how to measure the impact that we're having, right? I could potentially, I mean, I do have my plan about, like, I'm not consuming this type of food or I'm not taking this um transportation decisions but it's very difficult to compare them and to have even a metric that we understand even carbon footprint is very difficult in my mind to even understand what does that mean and how do i compare my decisions in one area to another and all of those um i'm i'm i'm, I'm giving this context uh because i I'm, so I'm a product manager here at Google, and I work in Google Maps specifically for driving. So one of the things that uh, we're working on is to say, OK, so how can we provide consumers with the information that they need to make a decision between uh, driving or taking a train? Um, and right now, the first thing that we, I mean, I'm working actually, is, well, at least tell the price, right? Like right now, if you take uh, if you say Google Maps, like, drive me here, it's free, right? When it's not really free, uh, well, you take the bus, it will cost more. Um, so what about, we're, we're thinking, well, what about the cost, like the environmental impact? And we're discussing, well, carbon footprint, can we calculate that? Can we put it there? And we're like, well, we may be able to do it. We will need to do a lot of work. We could do it. But would, would that matter? Like, would people actually understand what that means? What kind of education do we need to do? So anyway, I'm, I'm, those are the things that are, are going in my mind. I'm like, mm. I don't really know how to even use a metric or a measurement to say, to decide your decision, can you, now with the knowledge, can you take a decision? Well, I think that's such a great idea, first of all, of somehow providing information for people to consider when they're, I use 
Google Maps and I look at the different ways that I can travel. And the only consideration is time. Yeah. That's it. If I were given more information, it would not be my only consideration. It is very hard to calculate with any kind of real specificity um, the carbon footprint of different kinds of transportation. And those numbers might not mean anything to anybody. But it might be that like a scale with from red to green, you know, or a smiley face or a frowning face. Like I have a friend who started a company about 10 years ago where all they did was send up uh, along with your utility bill, they would have a, uh, a comparison to your neighbors uh, and to say, you've been using more energy than the average person on your block. Um, you've been using less. And they would literally give a smiley face, a straight face or a frown. And they found that people used about 6%, between six and 12%, depending on where they did it, less energy simply because of that, because of the information, because it like stimulates something in you. Sometimes like a, a weird kind of competitiveness, which is sort of fun, um, but also a feeling of approval or disapproval or that this is a good thing or that this is not such a good thing. I think changes like that actually really inspire me and I think could have a truly profound impact. Let me put it this way. It would have a profound impact on me. I absolutely know for sure that if I were using Google Maps and it conveyed the, 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 with the full starkness the difference between the choices in terms of the impact on the environment, it would just be, at, then if nothing else, it would be a daily reminder, a constant reminder. It would be a way to keep the conversation alive inside of me and I think would be a really great good. It would be a wonderful thing if Google could do that. And just a, a follow up, and because when I was doing this research, uh, someone brought that to me that a couple of years ago, Google actually released something about like calories consumed, um, and that was like a big disaster. <laughs> uh, saying to people, oh well, if you if you walk, you're going to like you're going to consume more calories or whatever, right? So it, it's better for you if you walk. Um, it was a pretty big backlash, mm -hmm. and actually it was removed. So that was kind of like one of the things that we're considering about like, okay, how are people also going to react to this? Um, I mean, I would say who cares? <laughs> I know that that's maybe not how you would address it, but this is not a problem like weight loss or health. Um, this is like a global problem that if people don't care about it, then I would say we don't care about them. And we have to find ways to make it something that can't be ignored. You know, and by the way, Google is going to be a less successful company if we don't solve the problem of climate change. They're going to, Google's going to fall apart. Like when people say, like, what's going to happen to farmers if we eat less meat? Well, there's actually really great answers to that question. Like there are going to be a lot more farmers as we move away from meat because 99.9% .9 of the animals that we eat in America come from factory farms whose mission is to remove farmers and to remove nature from farming. Um, there are fewer farmers now, not per capita, but in a real number, fewer farmers now in the United States than there were during the Civil War. It's insane. But there's another point, which is, what would it mean to save farming if, if we don't save the planet? You know, what what would it mean for Google to be like, you know, a growing company in a shrinking planet? Um, so, I hope that there are ways to overcome that worry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.